Welcome to this lecture about basic fetal ultrasound examination. Basic fetal ultrasound should provide adequate information for the gestational age, fetal growth, anatomy evaluation of the fetus, and the type of twins. The main scientific societies have provided guidelines for the basic fetal ultrasound from the first to the third trimester. The basic second trimester fetal ultrasound should be proposed to all pregnancies. And usually we perform it between 18 and 22 weeks of gestation. In fact it allows precise dating of pregnancy and good visualization of the fetus which still allows time for management. It must be performed by well-trained professionals with up-to-date ultrasound machine. How do we do that? There are six steps. First, verify the viability of the fetus. Second, identify the fetal number. Then, do fetal biometry. Then, do a basic anatomy survey. Then, look at the fetal environment. And finally, don't forget to transmit information. Fetal viability is the first thing to look for. The normal fetal heart rate is between 120 to 160 beat per minute, depending on the fetal activity. Abnormal heart rate and rhythm should be reported. Fetal bradycardia is considered when fetal heart rate is less than 110 beat per minute and fetal tachycardia is considered when fetal heart rate is more than 160 beat per minute. During the examination, you must see normal fetal motion of the body and extremities. Multiple gestations require the documentation of additional information, such as chorionicity, amnionicity, comparison of fetal sizes, estimation of amniotic fluid volume on each side of the membrane, and fetal genitalia when visualized. The first trimester is the best timing to define chorionicity and amnionicity of twins. If it has not done before, you have to determine chorionicity and amnionicity in the second trimester. How to determine that? You count the number of placentas. You look for the intertwin membrane, if it is thick with twin peak sign, this is dichorionic. If it is thin with lambda sign, this is monochorionic diamniotic pregnancy. You can use the gender of the fetus to determine chorionicity. In monoamniotic twins, you may see entangled cords. The third step is fetal biometry. Fetal biometry is useful to determine the gestational age, fetal growth, and to detect some aneuploidy and malformation. There are four mandatory fetal measurements. Biparietal diameter. Head circumference. Femoral length and abdominal circumference. These measurements must be done with rigorous technique. You have to repeat measurements, and your charts should be adapted to the population. Biparietal diameter is measured on symmetrical axial view, at the level of the thalami and cavum septum pellicidum. The cerebellar hemispheres should not be visible in this scanning plane. The measurement is taken from the outer edge of the proximal skull, to the inner edge of the distal skull. The head shape may be flattened or rounded as a normal variant. This may make measurement of the head circumference more reliable than biparietal diameter for estimating gestational age. Head circumference is measured at the same level as the biparietal diameter, around the outer perimeter of the calvarium. Head circumference is not affected by head shape. The abdominal circumference is measured on axial view through the upper part of the abdomen. It must be rounded with the stomach and short segment of the umbilical vein are seen. There should be no kidney or heart visible. The calipers should be put on the skin line. 
Abdominal circumference is used with other biometric parameters to estimate fetal weight and may allow detection of intrauterine growth restriction or macrosomia. The femur length. Femoral length can be reliably used after 14 weeks of gestation. Usually we measure the proximal femur to the probe. You have to see both cartilaginous ends and measures the longest axis of the diaphysis without including the distal femoral epiphysis. Ideally measure both femurs. After that, you can do a basic fetal anatomy survey. During this survey be systematic, this is the only way not to miss something major. Do standard scans and go a little bit more beyond the requisites of the major societies. Fetal anatomy may be adequately assessed by ultrasound after 18 weeks of gestational age. It may be possible to document normal structures before this time. Although some structures can be difficult to visualize due to fetal size, position, movement, abdominal scars, and increased maternal abdominal wall thickness. Fetal anatomy survey includes the head, face, neck, spine, chest, abdomen, and extremities. In fetal head, you see here the requisites. You have to look at the skull, the hemispheres, the midline, and the posterior fossa. The shape of the fetal head is normally oval and regular. And you must not have defects such as encephalocele. There should be no flattening such as in this lemon sign of carry 2 malformation. Or such deformations like in this case of craniosynostosis. And normally, the normal skull darkens the way you see the brain. If you see the brain details so good, this is not normal, and in fact there is osteopenia in this case of osteogenesis imperfecta. Look at the two cerebral hemispheres and the midline. You must see the falx cerebri and the cavum septum pellucidum. This is important because the presence of cavum septum pellucidum is indirect sign of the normal presence of corpus callosum. The corpus callosum can be depicted directly very well on sagittal view of the brain. Don't misinterpret the fornix as cavum septum pellucidum, the fornix shows internal line. You look at the ventricles and you have to measure the atrium of the lateral ventricle. The atrium is measured on symmetrical axial scan, you measure it perpendicular to the axis of the ventricle, almost at the level of the glomus of choroid plexus. And you measure from the inside wall to the inside wall. The normal atrial diameter is less than 10 millimeters. Don't forget there are two ventricles. You should measure both ventricles because sometimes the dilatation may be present in one ventricle and the other one is normal. Choroid plexus is usually homogeneous and echogenic. Normally there are no true cysts. Remember, there is no choroid plexus in the occipital horn or in the frontal horn. If you see something white there in these two horns, it may be blood or it may be something else, it is not choroid plexus. In the posterior fossa, the cerebellum is composed of two hemispheres and one vermis, and normally cisterna magna showing septations. Normally this cisterna magna is between 2 to 10 millimeters. This fetus is a Kiri 2 malformation with small posterior fossa and cerebellum is a banana shaped. Then we look at the face. You should see two orbits, one nose and two nostrils. And you should look at the upper lip whether it is normal or cleft lip as in this case. You then go down to the neck. The guidelines is to see only if there is a mass or no. After that, we follow the spine from the head to the sacrum, at least in two different planes. You look at the skin and vertebral ossification centers. You look for a defect or mass. 
You look for regular appearance of the bones for any deformation. And you look for intact skin. Here is the images on the bottom of the screen showing vertebral malformation. Then, go down to the chest. Look at the size of the chest. The chest is normally rounded in axial scan, with smooth transition with the abdomen. One third of the chest diameter is occupied by the heart, with both normal lungs appear homogeneous. There should be no masses. And we can see the diaphragmatic interface between the abdomen and chest. Look at the heart. Verify the situs and size of the heart. Its location and heart rhythm. Check that there is no pericardial effusion. Get a four-chamber view of the heart. And try to get view of the outflow tract of each ventricle. Then, go more down to the abdomen. The guidelines is to look at the stomach, its presence, location and size. Look at the insertion of the cord, and number of vessels in the cord. Normally, there should be two umbilical arteries, and one umbilical vein. We look at the genitalia, if medically indicated. The image on the left side of the screen shows a normal stomach. While the image on the right side of the screen shows enlarged stomach in a fetus with jejunal atresia. We look at the two kidneys. The length of the kidney is approximately corresponding to the number of weeks of gestation. After 18 weeks of gestation, you must always see the corticomedullary differentiation. Remember, when there is no kidney in its normal location, the adrenal gland may be elongated and may give a false impression of the kidney. Then, look at the extremities. The guidelines is to look at the four limbs, to the level of hands and feet. Look at upper and lower limbs on both sides. Look systematically from the shoulders to the hands, and from the hips to the feet. Check that there is one bone, two bones and five digits for the upper and lower limbs. And look at the positions for motion, and if there is no club foot. After that, look at the fetal environment. Fetal environment include the amniotic fluid, placenta and maternal anatomy. A qualitative or semi-quantitative estimation of amniotic fluid volume should be reported. Semi-quantitative methods are amniotic fluid index, single deepest pocket, and two diameter pocket. The image on the screen showing amniotic fluid index. The placental location, appearance, and relationship to the internal cervical us should be reported. The umbilical cord should be imaged, and the number of vessels in the cord should be evaluated when possible. Transabdominal, transperineal, or transvaginal scan may be helpful in visualizing the internal cervical us and its relationship to the placenta. Transvaginal or transperineal ultrasound may be considered if the cervix appears shortened or cannot be adequately visualized by transabdominal sonogram. Look at the maternal anatomy. Evaluation of the uterus, adnexal structures, and cervix should be performed. This will allow recognition of incidental findings of potential clinical significance. The presence, location, and size of adnexal masses should be reported. The presence of at least the largest and clinically significant myoma should be recorded. Again, if the cervix cannot be visualized, a transperineal or transvaginal scan may be considered when evaluation of the cervix is needed. And finally, don't forget to transmit your information. A good report must be clear, precise, and easy to read. 
Images should be labeled with the patient identification, facility identification, examination date, and image orientation. Don't hesitate to call the referring doctor if there is something wrong or if there is something to verify. There should be a permanent record of the ultrasound examination and its interpretation. Documentation and archives are necessary, and you have to follow the local legislation. The minimum is to follow the requisites of scientific societies. Thank you very much for your attention.